Hey y'all, it's Dave, and today I'm going to be talking about some of what encompasses the fullness of the hope of the gospel that I really see is lacking in the church, and I see people tormented because of lack of knowledge in this area. But first, Coffee mugs are available, so Facebook me, Instagram me, shoot me an email through the contact us tab at satabernacle.org, and they're $20 plus $5 shipping, and we can ship one straight to you. All we need is your email, and we can send you an invoice. So if you want a mug and been one of the ones that's been asking about these, then they're available. We also have stickers too. They're like three inches, I think. Yeah, three, two and a half or something. Little round, circular stickers that will go on your car and all sorts of things. So those are available for $3 a piece. So again, just shoot us a message over there. And then as always, if you enjoy the ministry and the work and the labors of this channel, then I would love it for you to visit my Patreon page and uh, you can become a monthly supporter for as little as $2 a month. And then a special thank you to the present and the past patrons who have supported me and supported the channel, supported the work of the audio Bible and the music and the teaching and the Bible reviews. So thank you guys so much, but let's get to it. So I know I talk fast and then when I edit, I talk even faster. And so I, I apologize, but that's just Dave Brown. But anyway, I wanted to take up an issue of hope that I see within the church. I've encountered this constantly in the counseling room with relationships. And this issue of hope is, am I really free from sin? I wanna talk about how, yes, you can live free from sin, but my heart breaks because so many people are left without hope because they've come to the wrong conclusions about God and they've been told the wrong things about God and people using and twisting and manipulating scriptures to say things that it does not say while boasting of hermeneutics. But uh, I, I just wanna say plainly, like part of the hope of the gospel and the fullness of the gospel message is that there is freedom from sin. Uh, this week or last week, I've seen a quote from Paul Washer, who I love and I listen to. Um, I have some differences with him, but I've seen this quote going around recently that Jesus saved you from God. And in other words, Jesus saved you from the wrath of God. While I agree with that concept, our definition shouldn't stop there. When the angel Gabriel came to announce Jesus's birth, one of the specific missional details that he said Jesus would accomplish is that he would save us from our sins. And that's an important word, not despite our sins, but from our sins. And now getting into the issue of original sin and walking free from sin practically in your real life and loving holiness because you love the Lord with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength can be an extremely controversial topic as men cling to their sin nature as like that's supposed to be normal. And then we call it humility and twist the scriptures to justify it. And it's just a tragedy. And some of you, if if you made it this far, might even be thinking like, well, why does this even matter? Why do we gotta talk about these issues? Well, these friends and relationships and people that I've seen in the counseling room, I've seen over and over and over men and women tormented with the thought that they can never be free from sin. And they're crying with tears, I want to be free from this because it's causing me harm, it's causing those I love harm. If you've seen my testimony, which I'll link at the end of the video and the end screen is my freedom from pornography, from abusing my wife. Like it was a really important thing that uh, Jesus didn't just come and overlook my sin and pay my debt and then do nothing practically to take it out of my life because otherwise I would have continued in what I was doing and causing those around me pain, harm, trauma, and those things. And so I see so many that are locked in because of bad theological ideas into expecting sin as normal. So I've sat with so many people that just express this frustration with what is presented as the gospel as just this acceptance of, yeah, Jesus paid it all, but he's left me in my muck and my mire. He's left me in my pain. He's left me to be bound and chained by sin practically every day. There's nothing that I can do about it. And so this is a big issue that I find torments many people. And it's been a pleasure to walk this road with many and begin to unwind the knots of bad theology to show them that they can live free from sin and actually pursue the Lord in a way through the scriptures and prayer that brings a physical renewal of the mind as you really begin to clothe yourself with Christ, put on the new man, and walk in the fruit of the spirit instead of the deeds of the flesh. 
So many I encounter across the body of Christ, it's like we're stuck in Romans 7 and we think that's normal. And we're just this wretched man who agrees with the law of God and says the law is good, but I can't do it even though I want to do it. And so our constant cry is, I'm a wretched man, like wretched man that I am. And then we just stop there, we stay there, we stay stagnant, and we think that's the whole of the gospel, that we've been forgiven, but we're always going to be wretched. And beloved, this ought not be, this is not the case. Don't stay in Romans 7. Paul asked the question like who will set me free from this body of death Romans chapter 7 verse 25 when Paul cries out wretched man that I am who will set me free from this body of death thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord and so he's crying out who will set me free from this body not just forgive me of what I do in my body but set me free from this body and I would submit like move on to Romans 8 because he answers the question in Jesus Christ he'll set you free from the body of death and so it's important to understand we've wrongly linked flesh and sin nature as one and the same reality and scripture does not do this but our theologians are doing this and our bible translators are beginning to do this where they're taking the term flesh and sin nature as synonymous terms and they're not and if that's a new concept for you or you've never considered it i would just submit for you in the psalms the psalmist cries out my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. And there's fleshly terms all throughout the Psalms of desiring holiness, walking in holiness. So the flesh of the psalmist saw his flesh redeemed. So they walked in a practical nature of holiness under what many of us call an inferior covenant, which I, again, I admit the outward forms of that covenant is inferior, but uh, a discussion on the priesthood and the order of Melchizedek is a whole nother probably video series I might get into. but going to stay on topic for this portion. So don't be stuck in Romans 7. If you're stuck in Romans 7 and feeling the pain and the groan of that wretched man constantly like seeking counsel from even our leaders that are telling us there's no freedom from sin. It's just our cross to bear that we're always going to deal with these temptations. We're always going to deal with choosing sin, like it's just gonna be a normal part of our life. And I would submit these very leaders who give this type of counsel are not walking in the freedom that I'm discussing in the video. Some of them probably are, so I don't wanna broad brush everyone, but uh, I was a part of a church several years ago who the pastor and I were agreed on many theological issues and especially the issue of holiness. It's a very important issue to me and uh, the work of grace actually producing in you a love and a walking out of holiness and righteousness in a practical way, not just an ethereal, like my spirit's clean while my body's a slave to sin. That's not scriptural, that's Platonism, that's Greek philosophy, that's not the Bible. And so anyway, me and this pastor were agreed on this issue, but this pastor fell into immorality and his doctrines of grace and holiness completely took a 180 to where at the end of when that ministry was open, him and I were diametrically opposed on the things that we were teaching and discipling people into, into holiness. Because he had walked into a compromise, he either had to repent and change himself or change his doctrine to justify why he could continue walking the way he was walking. And so I witnessed that before my eyes and it was shocking to me how quickly you abandon your convictions to justify your practice. And so I saw this and many men do this and we stay in Romans 7 forever without the vision of growing in holiness, seeing the necessity of it and seeing the love and the joy of it as well. But Paul is not stuck in Romans 7. Paul then writes Romans 8, guys. I'm just gonna begin in chapter 8, verse 3. He says, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Then, verse 4, so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk, again, action verb, according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And so it's changing our foot and walking according to the spirit. And when you're walking according to by the spirit, it's just talking about a closeness of relationship and building that relationship with him that you're growing in your friendship and your intimacy with him. And so that's what makes you holy and the holiness even overflows as you develop that relationship 
into your practical walk and into your flesh so that your flesh is actually changed and you enjoy holiness and can do holiness. And that's what he's talking about in verse 10. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his spirit who dwells in you. And so there's not a disconnect between your mortal body and your spirit. So when your spirit comes alive, it will overflow and give life to your mortal body. That's why he says in Galatians 5, 16, Paul says again, but I say walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Titus 2.11 highlights the same principle and this is the work of grace. The work of grace is not a cloak of invisibility, it's not a cover up, it's not just a legal forgiveness, but it's actual practical holiness that is built and fortified in you, heart, mind, soul, body. Grace comes in to teach you to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and live soberly and righteously in this present age is the work of grace. And so yes, the unmerited favor of being forgiven, but more than just being forgiven, it says in 1 John, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. What's the works of the devil? Sin and the effects of sin, not just ethereally, but really and practically so that he can establish his kingdom for real on this physical planet and bring heaven and earth together as one in Christ in you and so he's going to do it and don't deny him his power to make people holy. I love Lim Leonard Ravenhill for his quote and I'm just going to paraphrase the idea. The greatest miracle that the Lord does is to take an unholy man out of an unholy world, make him holy, put him back in that unholy world and keep him holy in it. I wholeheartedly agree. Every page of the New Testament screams holiness and righteousness for the sake of love, that he has the power to do these things. But so many of us are locked into our ideas of what original sin was and that we're born sinners and that we're always going to be this way and we're born with this sin nature. And I don't, I wouldn't deny sin nature, but there's a big importance on understanding where the sin nature comes in. Does it come in at birth or does it come in afterwards? And before I get into this part of the conversation, because I know many of you already have, if you've made it this far again, you already have your bias and you're just like chomping on your verses ready to pounce. And so I would like to disarm that if I could so that you would actually have an open heart and an open ear and hear a few things because the same ones that just beat people with intellectual prowess and claim hermeneutics, many of their own concepts fall apart when you hold them to the same standard that they're supposedly holding everyone else to. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and uh, I'll start kind of this segment with just this verse. Listen to it and you apply your own hermeneutic principles to this verse. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Apply a consistent hermeneutic to that with your interpretive grid and how do you not become a universalist at that point and accept that all men will go to heaven and no man goes to hell. Because it says all men died in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. And so I just kind of wanted to present that as a question first to ask, like how do you apply a consistent hermeneutic to that with an interpretive grid that says through Adam's act came our sin nature by birth. And I would submit that's not scriptural. Um, I was just reading through a lot of the historical confessions and many people have taken the scriptures to justify their own ideas when the very scriptures like in this creed, like the very scriptures they're using deny what they're saying that men are born with the sin nature. Um, and one of them is in Romans chapter 5, so I'm going to go over there, in verse 12. And so just, I'm going to read it slow and listen to the progression and the sequence of things. It's very important because it shows how our sin nature actually comes and when death sets in to every man. Because no one's denying our need for Jesus, no one is denying our need for the cross. I am 
personally a little bit wary of the argument of, well, you just have a high view of the fall of man. That's a silly thing to say. I think I have a biblical view of the fall of man. Trying to create like false exaggerations, it, it's pointless to me. Um, I just want a biblical view of the fall of man, um, especially because I see where the bad ideas of this have tormented so many and kept them in prison houses of sin and shame. And so in Romans chapter 5 verse 12, again, listen to this progression. It says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, I think we would all agree that that's Adam, just as through one man sin entered the world and then death through sin. And so death spread to all men. Why? Because all sinned doesn't say that they were born sinners. It said death spread to every man because all sin. Adam opens a door, sin comes in, and death came in through sin. And because all men sinned after Adam's transgression, death entered every man. That's way different than being born a sinner and God who desires truth in the inward parts, forming your inward parts, forming the very thing that is to become his enemy in the womb. That's just, it doesn't even hold water. And Psalm 51 is another section that people point out. David says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. And so being born in sin, being born in iniquity is different than being born a sinner, being born with a sin nature. And so you have the picture of like, just picture a water birth. Those are kind of popular right now. All the hippie people are enjoying their water births and birthing their baby in the pool. And so when the baby's born, it comes through the birth canal, it's born in the water, right? You would be a lunatic to say, oh look, the baby is the water we make a distinction between the water and the baby so why don't we do this with these plain scriptures and we assume that every baby who's born is born with the sin nature and is born this way instead of seeing the baby being born into the sea of iniquity and all these outward pressures upon the children um, growing up with the influences and uh, surrounded by the iniquitous environment that forms and shapes their thinking and their choices and their patterns of living throughout their life. And I think this is an important concept to grapple with and to see biblically because then we can see the full picture of redemption instead of being born with a sin nature and that Jesus forgives us of our sins, but we still maintain a sin nature and we're always gonna be a broken wretch stuck in Romans 7 who can't do Romans 8. Some people are fine with that and they enjoy like, oh, God's a good savior, he forgave me because I'm such a terrible person, but they never change and there's no acceptance or vision to change and we just use grace as this free pass, like Jesus paid your debt and bless the Lord like he's paid our debt, but he paid our debt unto something and so seeing redemption in its proper scriptural context of you were not born a sinner, you were not born with a sin nature. The environment around you conforms your nature as you continue to choose sin. Death entered into your body and your spirit by your choice of sin. Sin is not a substance. First John says sin is lawlessness. And so your continual choosing of lawlessness has conformed your nature to where you are operating out of a sin nature. But the good news of Christ redeeming us is we're being restored to his original creative purpose and design. Please note, like in Genesis in the fall, God doesn't show up and say, behold, man has become corrupt. He says, man has become like one of us. I would challenge you, if this is new or offensive to you, look up the scriptures that talk about sin nature and all the scriptures people use to associate being born as a sinner with sin nature. Just read them slowly and just take them verbatim and the very scriptures they use just brings an indictment upon that idea. And it's so important that we see this to see that we can walk free from sin, to get free ourselves and then be able to pull others out and to partner with Jesus in his ministry of destroying the works of the devil, which again is sin in the body, the effects of sin around us and putting that to death and establishing his kingdom in a real practical way to become a lawful people because we want his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven and with his kingdom comes the embracing of his law the legislature of his kingdom and that we would be a kingdom of priests 
and a lawful people in love with him, walking in holiness practically, because again, we love him with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. We love our neighbor as ourselves, and on these two hang the whole law and the prophets. This is a passionate issue for me because of my time in counseling with people and developing friendship with people, seeing the torment behind this, even seeing demons torment, and you see how the enemy uses twisted interpretations of scriptures, twisted doctrines, and plants these as seeds in, in men, and then he's able to work in behind the scenes and just keep people tormented, keep people bound in this area. And so I'm, I'm passionate about this. I'm passionate about seeing people legitimately get free and giving them hope and watching them walk in the hope of you can really renew your mind according to his word and it will affect your practical walk. It will set your mind free. It will bring healing and life into your body. I don't know why people wouldn't want that. I don't understand just the constant offense that rises up around this issue and seeing men who claim I'm new creature in Christ just fight vehemently to maintain and justify their sin nature as if like that's normal and that's God's creative intent. Like no, he desires truth in the inward parts. He desires a humble and a contrite heart. And so being able to let go of your defense of a foreign nature, an enemy that should not be present in your body, embrace Christ in the fullness of the gospel and actually live holy. And so again, this is a big controversial issue in the church and I just I don't understand the controversy because the scripture is very plain. But one of the scriptures that comes up as an argument against this is 1 John. At the end of chapter one it says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And so every time I have this conversation, the connotation is if you don't admit to sinning every day in word, thought, and deed, then you make him a liar. And the scripture doesn't say that. And so I'm not denying that I have never sinned. That would be preposterous. And that's not scriptural and I recognize the scripture, but it's not saying that you cannot live free from sin. I mean, testament to the fact of we're twisting that interpretation and trying to apply it to our daily thought life and our daily in our daily walk of we're always gonna sin every day. It's just absolute ludicrous. It's like, is the rest of 1 John ripped out of the Bible or something? He says, my little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. And if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He goes on in chapter two and then in chapter three in verse seven, little children, make sure that no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. Oh my goodness, the one who practices, a practical action verb for your life. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. Verse eight, the one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning, and the Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil, which is sin, and the effects of sin, which is death, and all that baggage that comes with it. Verse nine, no one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice, there we go, our practical action verb, anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. So, I mean, just in light of that, why do we fight tooth and nail for an unbiblical doctrine of the issue of original sin and maintaining our sin nature as a normal thing. The sin nature staying in a Christian is not normal and if it continues to abide in us, something is terribly wrong. Yet we have whole doctrinal concepts that keep people bound to these ideas and never live in freedom and we've become just like the very Pharisees that don't let people enter the gate and we don't enter ourselves. But again, anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. And so again, just to that, if we say we don't have any sin, we're calling God a liar. Read the freaking rest of the book, man. Uh, and <laughs> especially before you start lecturing me on context. And uh, so anyway, I am, if you can't tell, I'm super excited, passionate about these issues. It's not an issue that breaks fellowship, but I will stand strong and bold on practical holiness and maintain this as an apostolic hope of the fullness of the apostolic gospel. So there's hope if you're one that's been struggling trying to fight this and you're like many of my friends who have been to pastor, to pastor, to leader, to leader, from peer to peer, like 
how do I get free from this? How do I get free from this? I want this to leave, this is tormenting me, it's hurting those around me. There's real freedom from walking in sin and it's found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. A real relationship where you interact with him as a person and it's so much fun. And for that, I would point you to genuine repentance, which many preachers are trying to just gloss over this and just make it some like, floaty thing like it's just changing your mind and agreeing that Jesus is God and that's it. No, it's repenting. It's confessing and forsaking like the scripture said. It's a confession of your mouth. Yes, is a change of mind, but your change of foot proves that you had a change of mind in the first place. So you confess it, you change the direction of your walk, you change your foot, and you forsake those things that are causing you to stumble and are an affront to Christ and you embrace Christ at the cross and then let him grow you up into maturity and for that I would just submit my playlist of restoring delight in the word learn how to grow discipline yourself in the word in prayer constantly before his presence filling your mind with what he has to say in scripture and journaling your prayer times and be completely absorbed and given over to that and you will renew your mind according to his word. He promises these things in scripture now for this life as a real practical reality. So there is hope and freedom from the things that are binding so many. And I'm passionate about tearing down stupid theological ideas that keep people bound as a slave of sin and tormented by demons. And so, Anyway, I had said a couple months ago that I was about to get a little bit more theological on my channel. I know I have the once saved, always saved video on there and my thoughts on that. And so I'm just kind of going, you know, taking it slow because I know with these issues will carry some controversy. I'm happy to engage on these issues in the comments below or privately if you want to do that. But I just ask you to keep a humble spirit, be open to reason. Um, concerning this issue specifically and many others, but this one specifically, I've never had a brother or sister finish the conversation. I'm usually the one with the last word or the last question and they just walk away. And so I am open to having the conversation um, at length with individual because I know how deep seated this is. And I approach conversation as I'm open to being wrong too. Here's what's preventing me from jumping on your side of the fence, help me so that I can see your perspective better if I'm thinking about it wrong. But anyway, I challenge you to look up all those scriptures. Look up the scripture references and the creeds of why they justified their, cert their doctrines. Um, look up these scriptures and hold them up, up against plainly to what they're saying. And I have found many of the interpretations of the scriptures that they're using to justify their position to be found wanting. And so anyway, that, that is all just a fun, lighthearted, encouraging video. You can live free from sin. So if you guys like, again, the work and the ministry of the channel, you can support me over on my Patreon page, and I'll link that in the description. If you like the music under this video or any of my videos, you can download it all at forloveoftheword.bandcamp.com, and I will see you guys next time, I think with the Bible review next week. So y'all take care. I'll see you later. Bye.